In the blink of an eye, the first three months of the new school year are over. In that span, the students and staff at Lenape High School have accomplished so much. We are here to report on all that has gone on in the Lenape family this fall. Listen up and stay tuned. The fall 2013 edition of Tribal News starts right now. Welcome to our first edition of Lenape Tribal News for the 2013-2014 school year. I'm Lauren Clements and I am proud to be alongside Jack Watson. Jack, welcome to the Lenape Tribal News team. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, today we'll be bringing you some in-depth coverage of some of the biggest stories that happened here at Lenape this fall. We have so many exciting stories to share with you today. Lauren, what do we have to start us off today? Well, Jack. One major accomplishment of this fall was the school's official designation as a no place for hate school. Staff and students came together to earn this prestigious title. We now go to Ralph Palmero for more information about this accomplishment. Earlier this school year, Lenny Pier High School was inducted by the Anti-Defamation League as a no place for hate school. No Place for Hate is a program whose goal is to make inclusive environments in schools, organizations, and communities. The No Place for Hate program entered its second year at Lenape P in September and has already begun to help unify students throughout schools by reducing bullying and prejudice. Lenape is a perfect public school to spread diversity due to its many students in various clubs such as Asian, African American, Spanish, French, and Latin clubs. With a large range of students, it is important to unify each other. With a more unified community, it builds respect amongst everyone. The No Place for A program is tailored to fit the needs and cultures of any school, organization, or community. Mr. Tony Katani, Lenape P. South Principal and No Place for A advisor, thought it was very important that the No Place for Hate program was introduced at Lenape. I learned about the No Place for Hate program through seeing it in the paper about another school in the local area that was involved. Uh, and it just intrigued me to see what they were doing within their school and different programs and how they were infusing the No Place for Hate program into their school. Uh, so I, I found out about it through the newspaper and then just started going on the internet and going to the Anti-Defamation League to find a little bit more information about it. Mr. Katani, even though he likes having the No Place for Hate title at Lenape, does not believe that this induction is the most important aspect of the program. It's the kind of the cherry on top, you know, to achieve so many different programs, but it's more that I, I found out more that it's, it's about the program and instilling that type of respect amongst our students and staff that I really want to instill in the, in the building. Because this was the first official year of the program at Lenape, students were encouraged to follow the new upstander policy as well as different activities. To receive a nomination, a school has to perform a minimum of three anti-bias or anti-bullying activities. Over the last year alone, Lenape High School completed 11 projects and activities related to anti-bias and anti-bullying. Jacob Demery, a student member of the No Place for Hate Committee, believes that these activities are an important aspect of this committee. So through Mixed It Up Days where everyone is encouraged to participate in other activities, in the end everybody gets uh, accustomed to being part of the school and enforcing the ideals that No Place for Hate promotes. Overall, the No Place for Hate program has begun to successfully make Lenape a more open school to all ethnicities. The No Place for Hate program has successfully reached its goal to make respect, practice, and shared by everyone. My name is Ralph Pomero, reporting for Lenape Tribal News. Now back to the studio. There are many events for students during their senior year. However, the senior pinning ceremony is a unique experience that involves both the students and their parents. Here is Lindsay Wood with more on this annual event. Hello, I'm Lindsay Wood reporting for Tribal News. Each year, senior students and their parents make a pledge to each other at the senior pinning ceremony. Parents promise to support their child as they transition into young adulthood, while students pledge their appreciation for their parents. Senior pinning highlights the fact that the students acknowledge the parental support during their time in high school and how they are moving on to another chapter in their lives. It is a night where parents and their children get to appreciate the past and prepare for the future. 
Mrs. Cashman is a business education teacher and the advisor of Renaissance Club, which is the club that organizes the ceremony. She thinks very highly of the senior pinning and that it is a very important experience. I think it's important to have the senior pinning ceremony because it gives the parents an opportunity to see that their you know, young daughters and young sons are now becoming young adults and they should be given some more responsibility and some more trust as they get older. And I think it's important for the seniors to recognize the fact that their parents are giving them that trust and that it's a big you know, leap for their parents to say, I trust you, please you know, use your best uh, judgment moving forward. It gives them an opportunity to form a bond with their parents. The parents pledge to give them some trust and some added responsibility during their senior year. And the seniors, in turn, pledge back that they will honor that trust and that they will uphold the standards that their parents have set for them. Craig Cassidy is a senior who is actively involved in many activities at Lenape. I enjoyed it. I thought it was, it was a cool experience uh, for me and my parents. And uh, it was an opportunity to, you know, interact with them in a way that I, you know, haven't over the past four years. All seniors should attend the pinning ceremony because uh, it's, it's a crucial experience in your high school career. You know, towards the end, things are coming to a close, and uh, for them to understand that and experience it and, you know, hear from their teachers and parents is uh, really important. After the pledges are recited, the students place a pin on their parents, and the parents, in turn, place a pin on their child. It is an emotional moment for the families, as the physical placement provokes the acceptance of allowing their child to move forward. Craig decided to attend and experience the senior pinning ceremony with both of his parents. He did not know what to expect at first, but he ultimately enjoyed the evening. The most memorable part of the ceremony was probably giving uh, the pin to my father. He got a little teary-eyed, so he's, he's a little emotional like that. Um, and uh, I don't know, it was pretty cool just trying to see, you know, how much it really affected him. Many of the events during senior year emphasize the bonds and memories between a student and his or her peers. It is easy to overlook the important support parents have given their children over the years. This unique experience allows for recognition of that support and highlighting memories of the students and their parents. For Tribal News, I'm Lindsay Wood. Now back to the studio. For one day this fall, elementary school students, not high school students, roam the halls of Lenape. Safe Trick or Tree in its first year was a rousing success. Ruth Demery has more information on this first time event. Just before Halloween, hundreds of children filled the hallways of Lenape to participate in an event known as Safe Trick or Treat. Although this tradition was held by other schools in the district for many years, this was the first time Lenape took part in it. The day was designed so young children could safely trick or treat on the ever so popular holiday, Halloween. The elementary school kids who attended got to wander the halls collecting candy from different extracurricular groups. Participants were responsible for creating a unique theme for each area. Groups volunteered to represent themselves by making a door or decorating a section of the school. There were several things that they were required to complete before Safe Trick or Treat could begin. We followed the Lenape Television Club to see what they did to prepare for the event. Mr. Ebison, the advisor of Lenape Television, observed all of the preparation that occurred leading up to the day the event transpired. Honestly, I didn't do much to prepare. All I did was tell my uh, students in the club. I'm the advisor of the Lenape TV Club, and we were one of the um, clubs to participate. And they got really excited, and they took care of preparing all the decorations for the door. But I just checked to make sure that they, uh, they remembered when the date was, but we were good. Students and faculty worked as a team to make Lenape as festive as possible. Using an assortment of different Halloween-themed decorations, they began work at 11 that morning. However, in order to complete this step, they had to decide how to create a happy and safe environment for all who attended. Lauren Musilli, an officer of Lenape Television, was very involved in the creation of her club's theme. The idea for our theme was like superheroes. Um, it was kind of something that we all were like, talking about and all excited about. We all really like superheroes, so we thought it would be cool. So um, Juliet Harrison, who's on the social committee for LTV, um, decided to come up with like the Batman spotlight and project it on the doors. And then we all kind of pitched in, we colored, we cut things, we pasted it onto the door. I thought it went well. I think people enjoyed themselves and we had a really good turnout, so that was a big deal. Safe Trick or Treat was obviously a huge success. On top of a day full of fun, all the leftover candy was donated to the Ronald McDonald House. I'm Ruth Demery, and this is Tribal News. Back to the studio. 
This holiday season, the Interact Club celebrated Thanksgiving by providing families in the community with a delicious feast. Melissa Cheeseman was there to cover this great cause. Hello, I'm Melissa Cheeseman reporting for Tribal News. Every year during the holiday season, the Interact Club is responsible for providing a holiday feast for the families of the Mount Laurel community. The event's called Project Thanksgiving, and the club members are responsible for everything from the planning and organization to serving the families themselves. The Interact Club, advised by Mr. Porco, is directly affiliated with the Mount Laurel Rotary. Student members are responsible for many service projects over the course of the year. One of Interact's most important projects is Project Thanksgiving. Mr. Porco is responsible for the organization of this wonderful event. When I first took over Interact a few years back, the first thing we did was we had a meeting to determine what kind of projects we were going to try and accomplish uh, first semester. One of the ideas that was mentioned was hosting a Thanksgiving dinner for families need around the Mount Laurel community. We thought it was a great idea. We had you know, students cooking the food, you know, serving the food. And with the assistance of the Rotary, it turned out to be a great night. The project has been successful, uh, one part because of planning. Uh, Interact students know that when we plan this event, people are specialized in what their responsibilities are. And by specializing, you know, people concentrate on one thing, and it makes the project run a lot easier. In addition to that, uh, the planning aspect, the students who are involved are very dedicated. And when they, you know, you know, help out, whether it be making decorations, serving the food, helping clean up, cooking. I know they're giving 100% effort, so I think it really comes down to the planning and the students. Students could sign up to volunteer and help with the planning of a dinner for families in the community to come and eat for free. Food for the dinner was acquired through donations from the school's holiday food drive, and some was also purchased by club members and Mr. Porco. In previous years, the food was cooked at the school, but out of convenience, everything was cooked by the students at home this year. Members of the club were responsible for setting up, cooking, serving, and cleaning up the food. Service hours were rewarded to those who chose to participate. One of the club members, Kristen Batoski, has been a part of the project for the past few years. I first joined it because I thought it would be great hours to do and help other people. And then after I realized what it was really about, I thought it would be great to keep participating in because it really helps people. Last year, I was on the serving team, so I helped serve the foods, all the people. And this year, I was on the cleanup crew, so after everyone left, I cleaned up. Many families have attended the feast over the past few years. When asked why this event is worthwhile, it is very easy to recall many situations that make the project so special. When I have the, the uh, opportunity, I like to interact with the, uh, the guests. And when you go around and you're talking to these people, and you see the kids smiling and they're all happy and the, the people are so greatly appreciative, it makes you feel like you've done a job well done. In fact, there is a gentleman who, I've seen him two straight years in a row, I don't know his name, but he raised, he thinks it's a great time, the food's great, so when you hear things like that, it really makes you realize you know, what an important and valuable um, service you're doing to the community by helping these people. No moments in the past have particularly stuck with me, but usually during the event, people come up to you, they thank you, you can just tell everyone's having a good time, everyone's thankful, so it definitely pays off just to see that. Project Thanksgiving is one of the most popular events among the services which Interact does. It is the event for which most students sign up to work. Well, being a community service club, I think a lot of students truly like to be actively involved. Some of the other projects that we do, collections for instance, you're doing good, but you're not engaging yourself with the people who you're going to be helping. In this case, these students are you know, physically interacting with the people they're helping, and I think that means a lot to the students that interact, and that's why that's always the first choice among people when they sign up for projects, that everyone wants to do the Thanksgiving dinner. Interact Club's Project Thanksgiving is a successful event that allows students to give back to the community. The dedication of those who have contributed is greatly appreciated. I'd like to thank Mr. Porco and Interact Club member Kristen Batoski for speaking with us. For Tribal News, I'm Melissa Cheeseman. Back to the studio. Students throughout the Lenape District experienced a powerful presentation from motivational speaker Chris Heron. Here at Lenape, his message certainly made an impact. Max Bass presents more on Chris Heron's visit to the school. Chris Heron, a former NBA star, saw his life drastically change as a result of substance abuse. Despite his talent, his decisions ended his career and sent him on a path to turmoil. 
Chris now uses his experiences as a motivational tool to talk to students. Lenape students have the privilege of hearing Chris's story one day this fall. The presentation impacted everyone, including Principal Mr. Tony Catani, who had the chance to sit down with Chris. Hi, I'm Mr. Catani, Principal of Lenape High School South, and I'm extremely proud to have with me Chris Heron from 30 and 30 Unguarded just recently did a presentation for our freshmen and sophomores here at Lenape High School. We're extremely proud to have you here. Thank you. Uh, a lot of students extremely proud to be here with you. Uh, you can see everybody in the school is wearing purple today, so we're supporting Project Purple, uh, one of your foundations. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a few questions about your, your message that you're providing to our students, but I wanted to get a little more background for the viewers out there. Uh, if you could tell us about how was it to be a teenager at Dur Durfee High School in Mass? For me, it was... Um, very stressful, a lot of pressure. Um, you know, I had a God-given ability to, and talent to be a basketball player, and um, with that came some expectations, and not just expectations from the outside, but self-imposed as well, and I, I didn't handle that well. Um, so I try to stress the kids all the time that, you know, don't, don't set yourself up. Enjoy basketball, enjoy sports, enjoy high school. Mm -hmm. um, because what ended up happening to me was is I seeked other avenues of pleasure, okay. of fun. You know, where basketball should have been fun, sports should have been fun. Once that ended, I went out to party. Okay, so moving on to your, your, your message, okay? What makes your message so impactful for, for teenagers and for parents? You know, I think the transparency of the message, I think the honesty, I think kids identify with that pretty quickly. You know, um, kids are the best at reading, um, the phoniness, the fake, uh, sure. and I think they see me giving my story in a way that uh, doesn't sugarcoat it, and I think they can identify with that. You know? Yeah, I, I agree with that as mm -hmm. well. Um, how is it different for teenagers today than it was when, when you were a teenager? Facebook and Instagram um, was non-existent, and I think both of those uh, social media outlets put a lot of pressure on kids. You know, parents often say, you know, the media is doing a horrible job because they're glorifying alcohol. And if you ever look on your son's or daughter's phone, their Instagram, the images that they see on a daily basis of red solo cups and ping pong balls and marijuana leaves is way more than they see on a TV. How did your substance abuse impact your family when you were a kid, your, your mom and dad? You know, they were going through their own. You know, my dad's an alcoholic and my mom um, was fighting the urge of divorce for many, many years. Okay. You know, she was living in a house where she wasn't happy and she fought for her family and wanted to keep it together. Okay. Um, my dad's alcoholism had more of an impact on our family when I was young than I did. Unfortunately, it was his alcoholism and their marriage um, that my brother and I took advantage of, you know, because we had so much, so much more freedom. Sure. You know, I tell kids all the time, you know, your parents who are out working late um, and trying to provide for you, you know, you're taking advantage of that mm -hmm. by going out and drinking and knowing sure. the parents will be home at seven. We have plenty of time to do this. Yeah. What have you learned about teenagers during your speaking engagements? Well, teenagers, it's my favorite group, you know. Um, if I could do all high school, I would because high school kids are at a point where, you know, they feel it. You know, those guys in college, they've made their decisions, they're kind of set in their ways, um, and they're going to have to learn from their mistakes. Where high school kids are at a point where they can, you know, they're on the fence. You know, there was a lot of kids in that auditorium today, in my experience, that will email me after and say, Mr. Heron, thank you for making me not second guess myself anymore because I was at a point where thinking I had to drink and smoke to have fun. Chris Heron has an amazing message that inspires people. His program, Project Purple, helps families struggling with addiction. Students dealing with substance abuse have a chance to finally get help. I'd like to thank Mr. Heron for taking his time to talk with Mr. Gatani. For Tribal News, I'm Max Bass. Back to the studio. I definitely found Chris Heron's presentation very impactful. What did you think, Jack? See, I thought the, the presentation really spoke to us because he showed us, yes, it can happen to you. Yes, and I, I think that the students throughout the school responded very well. And it, I think his message was that even if you are having problems, it's not too late and that you can find help. A lot of positive feedback indeed. Definitely. Now let's move on to a bit of a more academic issue. 
Tutoring isn't just for teachers anymore. Lenape students have come together to form a peer-supported tutoring group called The Center. Samantha Goldstein takes a closer look at this story. The Center is an all-inclusive tutoring facility that provides students with one-on-one -on -one peer tutoring. All levels of all subjects are offered, including mathematics, history, English, and science. Many students have benefited from the Center since its opening in 2011 and continue to show vast academic improvements in their overall performance. Students come to the Center on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays after school in E103 to receive extra help in their subject areas, improve their grades, and get a new perspective on the material. Tutors help to do this by encouraging students and show them new techniques that can help them grasp concepts, which ultimately allows them to obtain a greater understanding and achieve their academic goals. The true key to the success of the center is the relationship between the student and the tutor. It provides a new way for students to learn in a secure and healthy environment. Mrs. Michelle Kane, one of the co-advisors, explains her take on the center's purpose. The purpose of the center was to provide students with an additional resource to get some extra help in different um, classes they may have. Something beyond just staying after school with a teacher um, to try to get a different perspective on the material. I think what kids appreciate or what they really get out of the center is having the peer tutor that sometimes another student is able to put material into maybe kid terms um, or they've seen it from another perspective outside of what the teacher has um, given the information as and there's a lot of aha moments sometimes when our peer tutors help out. A tutor at the center, Covey Manjal, explains how he helps and encourages students. Uh, I'd like to try and encourage students by never really getting down on them, even when they're having a tough time, and just always uh, helping them in different ways and trying to figure out new ways to help them all the time. I think peer tutoring definitely has something to do with it because students like to be helped by their fellow students and not by teachers who are much older than them. They can relate with students who also uh, are going through the same things in their lives and are learning the same things. Um, peer tutoring, I think, helps because um, certain students really identify with other students. Um, I think the other benefit of peer tutoring, as it has taught some of our client students, that they too can come back and help, um, and that they're very good in certain subjects, um, and they can make a, um, a real connection with the other kids in the school, especially in the topics that they're pretty proficient. I think it's as successful as the kids who work it and the kids who come to it that you know, taking some extra time to refresh yourself with material or even just trying and practicing more than I think most of our students do has definitely been helpful. Um, and I think it's a, a safe place to study and to review. The center provides a secure learning environment for all students. Their slogan, earn the grades you want, says it all. These students have dedicated their time and energy into helping their peers succeed academically and beyond. With its help of its motivated tutors, the center will continue to thrive and help even more students achieve their educational goals. I'd like to thank Mrs. Kane and Covey Manjal for their time. For Tribal News, I'm Samantha Goldstein. Back to the studio. The marching band continues its recent string of championship successes. Let's go to field reporter Derek Hale for a report on the 2013 marching band. There are multiple clubs and activities to get involved in, but only one that combines music, movement, and leadership qualities. Lenape's marching band has been around for 55 years and has succeeded in winning eight championships in the last 10 years. Students in the marching band began practicing in July and participated in a band camp where they got a jump on their new music. The musicians learned their music before the school year even started. In order to make their performances perfect, they stayed after school Monday and Thursday, in addition to practicing for 10 minutes every day before homeroom started. Lenape's marching band has been led by just four instructors since the program was established in 1958, which proves just how successful they really are. Mr. Waldron is the current instructor for the band. He is responsible for selecting the music and drill movements for the upcoming competition year. We have three pillars that we work with uh, in order to, to succeed as a group. Um, these pillars have been here since I've been the director. Um, I feel that the first thing we need to do is entertain the crowd. So that's definitely successful if we can entertain the audiences who are watching us. Got to have fun doing it, as I just stated. If we're not having fun, they're not going to have fun. And the last one, which is actually really the most important, is doing it at a high level of excellence. 
Uh, we have to make sure that what we do is the best that we possibly can so that the people who are watching the show uh, can enjoy it for, you know, for the entertainment value that we put forth. Lenape's marching band has 15 championship banners displayed around the classroom. The band placed first out of all bands in Tier 2 as part of the national championship in 2011 and have placed second nationally in 2012 and 2013. Besides performing at competitions, they also participate in the Lenape football games and multiple yearly parades. In order to make these performances exceptional, it's important for the band to develop a good relationship with each other. Ashley Sulon explains just how important a unified band is in relation to their success. Since we're all friends, like, we enjoy being around each other and we always look forward to coming to practices and look forward to, to doing stuff in the practice. There are times when you can goof off with your friends, but that's after you get all the hard work done. So that's, like if you enjoy doing the hard work, that leads to more good times. And you can incorporate um, having good times while working instead of just having a good time while you're on your break. Marching band consists of some of the most skilled and talented students in the high school. Their ability to learn these songs, drill movements, and still maintain good grades in school is a skill that not many people have. Mr. Walger and all those in the band wish to continue their good work as long as they are with the marching band program. To quote Mr. Waldron, if you are not having fun doing it, then the fans aren't having fun either. And this motto is followed by everyone in the band. I'd like to thank Mr. Waldron and his students for taking their time to speak with us. For Tribal News, I'm Derek Hill. Back to you in the studio. Some students go above and beyond driving safely. They want to make an impact on themselves and also on the new inexperienced drivers in the community. Let's go to Andre Gray and E101 for more on Drivers Education Club. Drivers Education Club is a relatively new club. In its third year of operation, it aims to inform students about safe driving habits. The club is run by Drivers Education teacher Mr. Michael Kershaw with the help of students. This club helps the community learn about making safe choices on the road. The club is always promoting the district initiative, Heads Up, Eyes Forward. This slogan is splattered all around the school and is promoted in all of the driver's education classes. They are seeing the results due to the decreasing number of student accidents. The club tries to bring the slogan not only to our high school, but to the community as well. The Drivers Ed Club recently held a fundraiser at Pentros to promote safe driving. The club has made over hundreds of dollars to help buy tools and materials to make posters to spread around the school. Danielle D'Alessio is a senior and is the elected student president of the club. She helps plan events and fundraisers for the club. Danielle has been a loyal member to the club since its inception. Her help in the club is extremely important to Mr. Curcio because of her ideas and leadership she gives to the club. Drivers Education Club was created my sophomore year, so 2011-2012, um, and it was created to raise driving awareness outside the classroom. Um, the purpose of Drivers Education Club is to promote safe driving and um, to raise awareness because everyone is impacted by driving and we need to, people to know the consequences of distractive driving. Some things we do to promote safe driving are fundraisers, poster hanging, and pledges. Rebecca McQuaid is also a senior and was elected the co-president of the club. Rebecca helps the Drivers Education Club by making posters and hanging them up around the school. Her dedication to the club is crucial. At our driver's ed club meetings, we normally have a discussion and we'll decide what we want to do for that month and at the end we'll all pick up some posters and go hang them along the hallways. We're trying to make all the students in Lenape read um, these signs that are preventing you from doing distractive things in the car or drinking and driving or texting and driving just so those kids see the signs and realize that they shouldn't do it. The club continues to grow and is always seeking new members. Look for the club to participate in the community and for more fundraising opportunities. I'm Andre Gray, now back to you in the studio. The Trading Post is Lenape School Store. One unique component is a program that features a very special group of students. Michael Morosky reports from F Hall with more on this story. Hi, I'm Michael Morosky reporting for Tribal News. Every day a multitude of students pass through perhaps the most frequented place in the building, a small room located outside of the North Cafeteria, the Lenape School Store, also known as the Trading Post. 
The Lenape School Store offers many products for sale that range from Lenape apparel to breakfast items and coffee, along with your basic school needs like pencils, planners, and calculators. It also offers various school-related clothing for the students that varies in price. May students shop here during a selection of periods during the day, but most students don't know that the Trading Post is a facility run by students in the special education program. The program that Lampy provides for these students teaches them multiple skills that are applicable in the real world. Ms. Heidi Hirschblond, one of the advisors to the students in the Trading Post, feels as though the program is very beneficial to the students involved, despite the students sometimes having mixed feelings about the job. Our school store program is actually a class, retail careers class, which is offered at Lenape High School for our students with multiple disabilities. Sometimes they're fearful about doing something like running a register or uh, doing jobs independently. The students involved in the program learn real-world skills such as working a cash register and restocking shelves. Brooke Anderson, a student who is enrolled in the school store program, has a large role in the success of the school store and is learning lots of useful skills as well. Fun things happen here is actually teaching me how to use money, how to organize, and knowing which product goes which. The students who are enrolled in the program are always energetic and display many feelings of gratitude toward their instructors. The relationship between the kids and the teachers involved in the trading post is long-lasting and very emotional. This concept of helping one another is a great skill learned by the students, as it teaches cooperation and generosity, two skills that are very important in the jobs the students work. To conclude, the school store program here at Lenape is a fantastic cause and has a great effect on all the students involved. The students and teachers alike who are involved are not only learning about the topics at hand, but about themselves as well. Reporting for Tribal News, I'm Michael Morosky. Now back to you in the studio. This year's annual fall play was the classic A Christmas Carol. Though the spotlight is on the talent on stage, Tyler Davis breaks down one of the most important parts of production, the set. Though it was only a few years old, this auditorium has sold some of the spectacular shows in Lenape history, including Hairspray, Legally Blonde, and The Wizard of Oz. Although the outstanding work from the cast, crew, and teachers involved are huge factors in the success of these shows, what makes these productions really stand out are the sets completely constructed here at Lenape's own scene shop. Although the actors, script, and music are main elements for each show, the sets are always key for the production of every play. The fall play for 2013 is A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. The set for this show will stay in place the entire production, but the features to the set are more complex than ever before. The fall play set was more realistic than any other here in Lenape High School, having actual designs of historical buildings and homes. Mr. Box has been the chief mastermind of the sets for four years. He has a construction company he runs over the summertime, so his background in executing creative ideas is nothing new. Uh, yeah, it's something that, okay, we're, we're really lucky that we have the technology we have today where I can not only visualize my own mind, what I want to build, I sit down and talk with the directors, uh, Mr. Bausch or Ms. Hammond, uh, and they always, they always know exactly what they want. Um, and I can visualize and then I can sit down with them and they've been very gracious to allow me to have a little freedom also um, in trying to design things the way I can see it. Uh, and then, of course, working with them, we can come up with a design and uh, a functional design where they can uh, get their actors out on the stage and perform to the maximum of their ability. Uh, so we're pretty lucky there. Anthony Iradi is one of the lead actors in the fall play of A Christmas Carol. He depends on his actions with the surroundings around him to make sure his performance is nothing but perfect. There's a lot of people actually behind the stage and stuff with making the sets. It's uh, Ben's dad, Mr. Curvin, uh, Ben's mom, um, let's see, my mom, my dad, um, let's see, Miss Rector. There's just tons of people back there trying to do the most that they can uh, to get this show ready. So, yeah. All the musicals and plays here at Lenape High School never failed to impress. The set of A Christmas Carol was nothing short of perfection, and we all look forward to seeing what Mr. Boggs has to offer for us for the spring musical. For Tribal News, I'm Tyler Davis. Back to the studio. Storm Robotics, a team split between Lenape and Cherokee students, has become one of the most popular programs in the school. With its swelling membership, a new team was created. Evan Bradley explains more about this development. 
The freshmen and sophomores of Lenape and Cherokee High School are experiencing a huge change in the technology department. Storm Robotics' first tech challenge team, other known as FTC, has now been divided into two different teams. Newly comprised of FTC 7433 and the original team FTC 4390. I sat down with various members of the team to try and discover why this has occurred and how it will affect the teams. Many of the students are very experienced in how FTC works. The mentors thought it would be a good idea to split into two teams. This will help the knowledge be spread around more. Mr. Condorso is an advisor and mentor of FTC Robotics. He was fortunate enough to sit down and talk to me about this change in FTC Robotics. So the reason we created a second FTC team is that last year uh, the, the team uh, grew in popularity from the year before. I'm not sure exactly what the student numbers were from the year before, but last year we had over 30 students involved. Uh, FTC recommends about 15 students per team and uh, 30 of course is, is double that number. Um, so we started a second team with the intention of having two teams of around 15, maybe 20. We thought there might be some increase, not realizing that we would have over 60 students sign up for FTC this year. So uh, in hindsight, it's, it's really a, a great thing that we started a second team. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to accommodate the student interest in FTC robotics. Both teams are still comprised of software, mechanical, electrical, specialty field, marketing, research, and CAD teams. Both teams work together to accomplish the tasks that both teams need to achieve. Zach Ellis is a team captain of 7433. He was fortunate enough to sit down and talk to me about how the teams work. We work as one cohesive unit. We meet uh, at the same time. We do outreach together, we do fundraising together, and whenever one team needs a particular expertise, you know, if one team needs more mechanical or electrical or uh, help with coding, we do help each other, but we are as two separate teams. We build two separate robots. Storm uses their resources very efficiently so that both teams will have equal opportunity to strive and succeed. Grace Stradict is the team captain of 4390, and she was lucky enough to sit down with me and talk about how the two teams has, have split and how it is affecting the team. Before we were such a large team that not much could get done efficiently, so with two separate teams we are more efficient and we can make our robot like more towards perfect than we could before with only one big team. In competition, both teams work together as one so that both robots will succeed. If one team is lacking software information and the other one is excelling in software, the other team will help them. When it comes down to it, winning is nice, but learning so that you can improve in the future is not the worst thing. The advantages of there being two FTC teams is more students are able to be hands-on with the robot. Um, that's the, the primary reason that the second team was created. Uh, more students get more experience uh, being an integral part of the team. Uh, some of the disadvantages, one of our concerns at the beginning of the season or as the, the season started was that there would be competition between both teams. Um, that being said, uh, now that the season's underway, uh, what we're finding is that what we thought would be a disadvantage is a real advantage. The teams are cooperating with one another and helping one another with the design and uh, one team might have expertise in an area that another team doesn't have and they're able to raise the level of competition for both teams. After examining the new and improved FTC robotics, clearly it is important that there needs to be two FTC teams that work separately on different tasks. This has been Evan Bradley reporting for Tribal News. Now back to you in the studio. Student athletes work hard every day, but none of them can prepare for something as severe as an injury. The girls gymnastics team experienced this with two of their players this season. Here's Erin Sawatsky with more. The Lenape girls gymnastics team is a highly ranked and tightly bound group of aspiring gymnasts. However, this year the team has been affected by injuries to some of the most vital players. Despite these injuries, the team has accomplished many of the goals they have set out to achieve. 
When team captain Marissa Tosi and key contributor sophomore Allie Wesley were injured, the team helped the two to recover with their support. Even when the team was affected by injury or loss, they stayed strong and realized winning wasn't always the most important thing. The girls' gymnastics team always strive to do the best they could every day. They are known for their skill and competitive attitude all throughout their league. There was also a strong and supportive bond between the team. Even though the team was affected by injuries, they still strive to do their best. Coach McManus realized that winning was not the most important thing as well. We have really made strides here at Lenape uh, as far as becoming a, a strong competitor each year. Um, last year we were extremely talented. This year we're pretty talented, but we've been kind of plagued with some injuries that's really hurt us. So it depends on how healthy we are, but we, we'll be competitive every year. What went on behind the doors of the North Gym was a highly competitive but supportive environment. It was easy to see that the team was exceptionally talented by their high rankings and skill. But it was harder for one to see while sitting in the stands that a friendship existed between all of the girls. And it was that friendship that helped Allie and Marissa to recover. The team has pushed Allie to greatness, and this has helped her to win the state title for bars. Allie Wesley made a major impact on the team in her short tenure and she possessed great leadership skills. Despite breaking both of her legs before the season, she managed to come back stronger and with more drive. Coming back was really hard, because I thought I'd be able to do everything that I, was, I could do before, but I couldn't, and that was really stressful for, for me. So I had to keep working, and like, work really hard, like stay after to do extra conditioning and stuff to get everything back. Marissa Tosi was a great team captain and role model to her fellow gymnasts. However, she had sustained injuries that had set her back and prevented her from participating in state competitions. Despite this, she was always there to support and cheer on her team. Marissa, since the day she's come here, has been uh, exemplary as a, as a leader, as a gymnast. She has, um, the first year we ended up, she ended up having an injury at uh, sectional, so she didn't go very far there. But since that time, for the last two years, she was the South Jersey Gymnast of the Year. She had made All-State. Uh, she's just an intense competitor. Despite the daunting setbacks in the beginning, the team has managed to pull through with a strong, successful season. I'd like to thank Coach McManus, Allie Wesley, and the whole team for their input. For Travel News, I'm Erin Sawatsky. Now back to the studio. And that is all for this fall edition of Lenape Tribal News. We would like to know all of the hard work that students in Communication Technology 2 classes have put in for this production. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you'll tune in next time as we cover all the winter happenings here at Lenape High School. For Lauren Clements and the generous contributions of everyone here in Studio ND27 at Lenape High School, I'm Jack Watson.